talk about today is a couple of things. First, I'm going to talk to you about why we are all being inundated with issues because technology is changing so rapidly that we can barely keep up. I'm going to talk to you about focus and attention. I'm going to talk to you about our brains from a structural level and from a biochemical level. And then I'm going to talk about how, what neuroscientists know about how technology does affect our brains. And then I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of advice on how to keep your brain healthy and not support your software, not support your hardware, but support your humanware. So let's take a look at technology. Consumer scientists look at a metric called penetration rate. When a technology reaches, or any product, reaches 50 million users, it's considered to penetrate society. So those of us who are old enough to remember, radio took 38 years to penetrate society. The telephone took 20. Television took 13. Cell phones took 12. And then the World Wide Web came in, and everything spiraled out of control. Four years to go from nothing to 50 million people. iPods took three years. Blogs took three years. MySpace, remember that? MySpace took <laughs> two and a half years. Facebook took two years. YouTube took only one year. And Angry Birds took 35 days. <laughs> and in fact, what's happening now is all the new technologies that are coming in are coming in so rapidly that literally we are part of a human experiment. We are being inundated all the time, and I could have just as easily ended that with Instagram or Snapchat or Reddit or any of the technologies that within a very short period of time inundate our society. Part of what I do as a research scientist is I look at a variety of topics, and one thing I'm very interested in is how our students study. So we went into homes and sent in 279 observers to observe middle school, high school, and college students studying. We told the students, we'd like you to study something truly important, really important, like studying for a test, studying for some sort of project, something that's very, very important. We wanted them to focus. And what we said is, we're going to just observe you. And we sat in the background, and we observed them. We looked to see, first of all, every minute for 15 minutes, were they on task or off task? Were they studying what they said, or were they off task? What was on their computer screen at any given time? How much technology they use on a daily basis? We asked them questions about whether they had strategies for studying. We also asked them some questions about whether they preferred to work on something until it was done, and then switch to a second task, or work a little on this, switch, back, forth, back, forth. Not surprisingly, they all do that. And then we also measure, ask them just what's their grade point average. So this graph shows on the bottom side, you see the 15 minutes of observations. On the left-hand side, what you see is the percentage of time on task. First thing I want you to notice is that 70% was the average they were able to do. Even though they were supposed to be studying something truly important, 70%. So for the first couple of minutes, they were focused. And then they got distracted. And then they focus again. And then they get really distracted about the eight to 10 minute mark. And then they start to focus again, but we think that's an aberration because we think they realized, oh my god, the 15 minutes is almost up. I better look like I'm studying. And you notice that at 15 minutes, they start to tail off again. Other people have found exactly the same results for medical students, computer programmers, information workers, pretty much everybody about a two to three to five minute focus before we get distracted. And what distracts us most? Technology. Look what happens with the number of windows that they open up while they're studying. Again, on the bottom are the minutes, on the top are the number of windows. Notice, by the way, where it peaks, which is at that eight to 10 minute mark where they got the most distracted. They're continually opening up more windows. And in fact, the most off-task students had the most windows open. So remember I said we, we asked them their grade point average, and we thought, this is crazy. From 15 minutes, can we predict who will be a better student, who will have a better grade point average? And in fact, we could. First of all, those who stayed on task longer, more of the 15 minutes, had a better grade point average. Not surprising, but nice. Those who told us they had strategies for studying had a better grade point average. That's good also. Now comes the bad news. Those who prefer task switching, working on something a little, switching to this, back and forth, worse grades. 
Those who consume more media during the day, spend more time on their phones, more time on their computer, more time on their devices, worse grades. And there was one more predictor. Remember I said we saw what was on their computer screen? Visiting one website just once in the 15 minutes led to worse grades. And guess what website? Facebook. <laughs> if they visited Facebook just once, it didn't matter whether they visited it once or 15 times, they had worse grades. It's not just students, however, who are distracted. This is a Pew Research uh, Internet in American Life project that just came out. I thought it was totally appropriate. It said 25% of couples say smartphones distract their partners. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so why can't we focus? Why can't we pay attention? What's wrong with us? Well, we're facing two problems. In the outside world, we're getting constant alerts, notifications, beeps, vibrations from our smartphones, which we all carry 24-7, literally. And television has changed. Television used to be different. It used to be slower. And now there's quick cuts. There's, there's scrolling bars on the bottom and the top and the side and everywhere. But inside the brain is what's happening more importantly. There's two things are going on. One, mind wandering happens. And two, the brain is always thinking. And what it's thinking is oftentimes about technology. So part of the problem is behind, right here, behind our frontal area, behind our forehead. It's called the prefrontal cortex. I'm sure many of you know this. The pre that's me having my prefrontal cortex scanned. Luckily, they found something. Um, <laughs> The prefrontal cortex is very important. It is, first of all, and first and foremost, our executive controller. It is the seat of working memory. It's the seat of where attention and focus are. It's where we make our decisions. It's where we control whether we multitask or not. And importantly for young people, it's impulse control. It's controlling whether we make decisions that are not good for us. So let me talk a little bit about what we know about neurons in, in the brain and particularly in the body. When you are born, your nerve cells are like uninsulated wires. They're like wires if you strip all the coating off of it. And if you do that and then you plug something into a socket, you'll see sparks going all over the place. So this is what a neuron looks like with sparks coming out. And in fact, what happens is once you're born, you start to develop these, this coating called myelin, which are just fatty cells that wrap, start to wrap themselves around neurons and they continue to wrap themselves around neurons until you are old enough, and I'll tell you in a few minutes when you are old enough, to have all your neurons all insulated and all coded so the transmissions go from point A to point B effectively. The last area to be myelinated is right here, that exact area that's your executive controller, that's your impulse control. This chart shows that myelination, the process, is not really complete until people are in their 20s or even early 30s. And sadly, you'll notice that after about 45, it starts to go back down again, and we start to lose myelin, which, mean, which explains, by the way, why in, you'll be watching television, you'll walk into the kitchen, you'll open up the refrigerator door, and you'll say, hmm, why am I here? It's why when you lose your keys, you keep looking in the same place over and over and over again, hoping they'll magically appear. So what does it all mean? First of all, without myelin around your nerve cells, neurons don't conduct cell signals. The last area is right up here. This is your executive controller. This is your boss. And this doesn't happen until your late 20s and even in your early 30s. We spend a lot of time studying young adults and teenagers and even preteens now in terms of their ability to focus and attend. But it's not only about the structural part, it's really more about the biochemical part. And a lot of those chemicals have to do with anxiety. Just a few statistics for you. Two thirds of all teens and young adults check their smartphones every 15 minutes or less. Even if they don't have an alert, a notification, they check them anyway. Half of those get anxious if we don't let them check in, and I'll give you a study that shows that. Three quarters of teens and young adults sleep with their phone with the ringer either on or on vibrate, right next to their bed. And lest we think adults don't do that, half of all adults use their smartphone as an alarm clock. 
Not a very good idea. If it's your alarm clock, you get up in the middle of the night, you look at the time, and all of a sudden you get notifications and alerts coming in, and it affects your brain, and it keeps you awake. Has anybody ever felt their pocket vibrating? They've reached in, grabbed their phone, and there's nothing there. It's called phantom pocket vibration syndrome. <laughs> and believe it or not, it happens to all of us. And think about the ramifications of this great human experiment. Ten years ago, if you felt a vibration down here by, <laughs> down here somewhere, what would you have done? You'd have reached down and scratched because it would have been an itch. Now we don't even think it's an itch, we think it's a message. We think something important must be coming in, something critical. So let me relate a study um, that I think is very instructive and important. We brought in 163 college students into a big auditorium. Half of them randomly got shuttled into one door and they were told, go sit down, take your books and put them underneath the table, take your phone and turn it off and put it underneath the table. You can't talk, you're not allowed to, you can't be in the experiment if you talk, you can't do anything. The other half went in the other door and they were told exactly the same thing except we told them, oh by the way, give us your phone. We'll give you a claim check. So then what we did is 10 minutes later and then 20 more minutes later, so at 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and 50 minutes, we measured their level of anxiety. So what happened? Interestingly enough, it didn't matter whether your smartphone was under your desk turned off or we had it. Everybody got anxious. But some people got more anxious than others. People who were light daily phone users, meaning they could take it or leave it, they used it a little, they didn't use it all the time, if you look at their anxiety level, it was pretty flat. It didn't increase. Moderate daily phone users, a little increase in anxiety in the beginning, but then they leveled off. They got used to not having their phone. What about the heavy users, those kids, young adults who are always using their phone? First of all, they started out 10 minutes more anxious. In the first 10 minutes before we did the first measurement, they were already more anxious and they continued to get more and more anxious. And actually, the researchers were going to go another 20 minutes, but they decided it wasn't healthy. <laughs> so what happens biochemically? What's happening in our brain? Brand new study by uh, Leo Yekulis at Stanford just came out last week. And what he did is he put a device on, on people's computer screen that assessed what they were looking at at any given instant and when they switched from one screen to the next. He also had them wear a little band around their wrist that measured arousal. So first of all, he found that they switched from one screen to the next every 19 seconds. Every 19 seconds, that's astounding. And the most common switches, one in four switches, were either to email, where they spent only 40 seconds, just like bip over to email, check it quickly, or to Facebook, where they spent 78 seconds. But what happened to the arousal, which I think is much more interesting. On this graph, what you see is in the very middle is when they switched, and they measured before they switched and after they switched. Right here, at about 12 seconds before they start to switch, arousal starts to increase. What is that? Is it good arousal? Is it bad arousal? Well, interestingly enough, he divided the switches into two categories, work category and entertainment. Entertainment being Facebook, games and watching videos. And he looked at switches from work, doing work to an entertainment screen, or from an entertainment screen to a work screen. From the entertainment screen to the work screen, he found no difference in arousal, it was flat. Look at this, 25 seconds before switching from work to entertainment, your arousal level starts to go up. So people are starting to get excited 25 seconds before. How can you be working when part of your brain 25 seconds before is already getting excited about switching to Facebook, a video, or games. Gary Small at UCLA um, did some research where he compared people reading a book to people searching Google, and you could see that the brain is much more active searching Google than it was reading a book. Um, we're also starting to learn from neuroscience, and, and some of these studies are in need of replication but I'm gonna to try to summarize some of the things that we have learned that we know. For example, if you have more social network friends, more Facebook friends, more Instagram, whatever, 
people with more social network friends so, show an increased size of both their hippocampus, which is the seat of memory, and their amygdala, which is the seat of emotions. People who are gamers, and most of the gaming research, by the way, is done in Asia, um, show increased activation in the striatum, which is the risk-reward area, where you're weighing the risks and reward possibilities. Violent game players show increase in areas related to aggression, but also decreased emotions in the amygdala. And web addicts show increased overall activity across their entire brain, but the efficiency of the neurotransmission is not very good. So what do we need to do to stay healthy? Basically, there are three things I think we need to learn to do. We need to learn to focus and attend. We need to figure out how to calm our brain, and we need to understand the choices we make. So first of all, we need to learn how to focus and attend. And how do we do this in a world that is totally involved with technology? Here's a cartoon that displays that. The parents are saying, this should be interesting, and there's three kids mowing the lawn, all texting at the same time. Is this what we need to do? It's a New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> Those of you who have dogs will appreciate that more, probably. <laughs> and this is called the iPotty. It's an actual device. It was introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show this last year. And it does not come with the iPod, uh, the iPad, by the way. You have to use your own iPad. But it's designed to get little kids to focus on learning to potty train. And then is this where we're headed? You can see here somebody taking a picture of a family on vacation, and the family's not paying attention because they're all on their phones. So how do you train your brain to focus? That's a very critical thing. Think about a coffee break. Think about the old-fashioned cigarette break. We've created something called technology breaks, and they're very simple. We use them in schools. We use them in homes. We use them in restaurants. We even use them in business meetings. The basic idea is very simple. What I would have students in a school do is at the very beginning of class, they would take their phones, they would look for one minute. And then after one minute, the teacher would say, okay, turn your phone off, turn it upside down, put it right in front of the desk, and someone set their alarm for 15 minutes. When 15 minutes happens, it's the person whose alarm is set jumps up and yells, tech break, really loud. And that's the stimulus that everybody gets to check for one more minute phone upside down in front of them. So what happens to this? Well, eventually the kids develop a, a sense of, oh, this is really exciting, this really works, and then the teacher expands it to 20 minutes, and then 25, and then 30. And in most of the situations, what we do is we have start the class with a one or two minute tech break, check everything, 30 minutes of lesson, one or two minute tech break, 30 minutes of lesson, our class is over, Teachers report amazing success with this, that the kids are able to focus. Why? Because that upside down phone sends a signal that says, don't get anxious, you don't need to worry, you're going to get to check it soon. So how can you reset your own brain? Well, obviously meditation and biofeedback does it. Nature breaks do it. We know that walking outside in nature for just five minutes resets and calms your brain. Listening to music, looking at art, particularly art that you find attractive and beautiful, calms your brain. Exercise calms your brain. Laughing calms your brain. Taking a hot bath calms your brain. You know the old adage, you get your best ideas in the shower? Turns out, hot water calms your brain. Talking live to a friend, as long as it's a positive conversation, calms your brain. You can't talk to somebody and have an argument because that activates your brain. Practicing a foreign language calms your brain. Playing a musical instrument calms your brain. How often do you have to do it? About five to 10 minutes every two hours seems to be an efficient way of calming and relaxing your brain. It's also about what we call metacognition, knowing how your brain works. That's very important. Whenever I talk to groups of children from three years old on up, I talk about their brains and what goes on in their brains. Knowing how you best work in an environment with technology and knowing when your brain is overloaded and how to calm it down. So I advise something called, very simple called the ABC method. A, be aware of the options. Know what distracts you. If your phone distracts you, put it away. If email distracts you, like me, turn it off. 
If notifications bother you, turn them off. Be, breathe, calm, relax. Reset your brain often. About every 90 minutes to two hours, reset your brain. And finally, make good choices, good metacognitive choices. Don't keep switching your focus from one thing to the other. Try to learn to focus for 15 to 30 minutes at a time. You will be far better off. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time.